I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG. I've done several videos on the remarkable BITX40 radio offered by Ashar Farhan VU2ESE of India and available for US $59, which includes shipping. It's a quasi kit. It includes the pre assembled and aligned main board, a separate VFO, and some potentiometers and miscellaneous hardware. No case is included. My last video was a review of the building process. Now, let's look at how well the BITX40 works on the air. Before doing that, I want to talk about a culture difference between the Indian hams involved in the BITX40 project and American hams. We here in the USA expect that when we assemble a kit, it works. Once it works, we use it on the air and that's that. Only the bravest among us tries to second guess the kit designer. Well, the approach that Farhan and his colleagues take is quite different. The main building blocks of the radio are provided and work, as I'll show. But it is to be understood that the kit is minimalist and experimentation and expansion are expected. This is a radio for tinkerers, including those who want to reprogram it. Okay, on to the radio. I temporarily mounted mine in the plastic box it came in. Here's the power in, the coax connection, the switch slash volume control, the main display, the frequency control knob, the speaker jack connected to my own speaker, the microphone jack, and the push to talk button. I make note that I substituted my own button for the provided PTT button. The rig tunes across 40 meters and the VFO is nicely stable without the need for warm up. The display reads in megahertz. Right off the bat, I found the fourth digit after the decimal point, or in hundreds of hertz, to be quite distracting. I tried for a while to black this out so I could tune by the third digit, which is kilohertz, but I keep having to peek under the black mark to make sure the digit is zero. If this were a kit for keeps, I would say this is a major objection. But the VFO software is tweakable, and I plan to insert an extra decimal point prior to the last digit. Now to a more serious problem. When the single turn VFO knob reaches its upper or lower limit, suddenly the VFO starts galloping widely either up or down at 10 kHz intervals. I've lost track of the times that I was carefully tuning into a station and suddenly the VFO frequency jumped madly away. Were this a normal kit, this would be a showstopper for me. However, I've thought of a simple hardware fix involving inserting a 25 or 50 ohm resistor at each end of the potentiometer so that the pot itself never hits the rails to trigger the jump. Then a push button to short out the connected resistor will allow it to start tuning up or down. Another fix I want to put into software is to allow for jumping at three kilohertz intervals. That way I wouldn't miss any band activity. Some folks on the forum have talked about using a rotary encoder along with a software change. I'll leave that for another day, but that's the direction I'll go. By the way, each time you turn the frequency knob, you can hear a small click as the VFO switches to the next frequency in 100 hertz steps. This is not at all bothersome for me. In fact, it's sort of aural feedback that I'm changing frequency. However, some BITX40 owners, according to their posts on the BITX forum, find the clicks too loud. There's no automatic gain control or AGC. That means if you're wearing headphones and digging out a weak station and someone with an S9 signal jumps in, you'll have those headphones off in a fraction of a second. Some fixes have been posted about an audio level AGC, which I guess is a stopgap, but it could really use a real AGC that holds down the RF gain when a signal is strong, and the AGC voltage could drive a true S meter. Now, this is not a showstopper, but I would suggest listening with a speaker rather than headphones.
There is ample audio gain to drive a speaker, perhaps too much. I barely crack the audio gain open and have plenty of volume, even with the speaker. I think what I may do is put a resistor in series with the volume control to give me more latitude in setting the volume. I've had several QSOs. I want to state here and now this is a QRP rig, and QRP operating techniques are essential to having any QSOs at all. No one has yet answered any of my CQs. The best method to have a contact seems to be tailgating. This means that when you hear a strong station talking to another, you wait until they're done, then call the strongest of the two. Another method that works is to join a net when they finish their normal roll call and ask for any other check-ins. I joined a net oriented at those wanting to work for their Worked All States Award, and indeed, there was someone in Florida who wanted Colorado. I got a two-by-two two report from him, but we did complete the late afternoon QSO on 40 meters after several attempts. But QRP can get through well when the band conditions are right, and 40 meters is the right band at this point in the sunspot cycle. As far as signal reports I've been given, I've heard that the radio doesn't let any carrier leak through, but another station told me I did have a bit of carrier, meaning the balanced modulator wasn't balanced. I've been told that my audio is great, and I've been told it's raspy. These issues address why I decidedly do not recommend QRP as your first radio. Start out with 100 watts and a 40 meter dipole and build your operating skills from there. But one last little secret. If you mention your QRP, most stations and nets will try a little harder to pick you out. Some other observations. Operating the push to talk button creates quite a bit of audio noise. Also, and I think you can only hear this with headphones, for the first second or so into the transmission, you'll hear yourself. That's because of a unique feature of this rig called bi-directional amplifiers. The audio literally goes through the circuit one way when transmitting and the other way when receiving, depending on which transistors are turned on. Upon beginning transmission, the capacitors in the receive direction haven't quite fully discharged, so I hear my own audio played back to me, but very quickly, the receive path fades and the transmit path takes over completely. I consider this more a uh, <clears throat> feature of the radio than a defect and don't plan to do anything about it. Using my little pen mic takes both hands one to hold the mic and the other to press the case-mounted push-to-talk button. This is an awkward way to operate, so I will modify it to have the push-to-talk button on the mic. Okay, let's sum up. If this were a kit advertised as a QRP rig you can build and operate, I'd give it a pretty low rating. But it's advertised not as that, but as a basic framework from which to experiment further. Every problem I've talked about has at least one solution. The BITX forum at the address shown on the screen and in the accompanying text is extremely active and has a many gigabyte archive of many photos and drawings of various approaches. My next step is to make the mods I mentioned. After that comes setting up an Arduino software development environment so I can tinker with the minimalist code in the VFO and display circuits. After that, I will mount it in a nice cabinet that was sent to me by YouTube subscriber Michael Struzik, a beautiful piece of workmanship. You can expect some more BITX40 videos from time to time. Please click like and please subscribe. Check out the Ask Dave playlist and the tip jar. A stitch in time saves nine. Leave a comment, ask a question. Until next time, 73.